You are hereby summoned to attend the meeting of the Health and Community Committee, which will be a hybrid meeting conducted remotely via WebEx and physically in the Council Chamber, Dairy Road, Strabane, on Thursday, the 9th of February, 2023, at 4 p.m. Alderman Deveni. Here. Kurt. Alderman Guy. Alderman Kerrigan. Alderman Guy. Yeah, here, Karen. Alderman Kerrigan. Here, Karen. Councillor Michaela Boyd. Councillor Doyle. Online, Karen. Councillor Duffy. Councillor online. Councillor Edwards. Councillor Farrell. Here. Councillor Ferguson. Here, Karen. Councillor Harkin. Councillor Jackson. I'm sure, Karen. Councillor McGinley. And Shaw, Karen. Councillor Sonoya Barr. Yeah, Karen. And Councillor Tierney. Here, Karen. And can I just double check Councillor Harkin? Thanks, members. Thank you. Uh, members, very welcome to committee this afternoon. Item three is a broadcasting statement. I'm going to read it out now. I'd like to remind everyone present at this meeting in Strabane Council Chamber or in attendance remotely that this meeting is, uh, will be broadcast live to the internet and will be capable of repeated viewing. This broadcast may be terminated or suspended in accordance with our protocol. Due to your attendance at the meeting, you are consenting to being filmed and to use and storage of those images for broadcasting or training purposes and for the purposes of keeping historical records and making those records available to the public. Members and the previous speakers are reminded to only have their mics and cameras on while speaking at the meeting and to use the chat facility to highlight a request to speak. A copy of Council's privacy notice may be found at dairyandstraban.com. Members, item four is declaration of interest. Um, you can raise them there, or raise them in the chat box. Councillor Tierney, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a note that I'm a steering group member of Life After. Thank you, Councillor Tierney. I don't see anyone else indicating or any other decorations on online. Yeah, apologies, I was trying to do it in the chat box, but I'm also a steering group member of Life After as well. Yep, thank you, Councillor Ferguson. Noted. Okay, members, going to move on to um, item five, which is a deputation from uh, Life After. And we have Debbie and Marie. I'm here presenting to council today. Hopefully you can hear me, Debbie and Marie. Yes. Yep, there we go. Okay, very welcome to committee, first of all. And it was great to, to meet you and Gavahi at the day five campaign launch. I'm really, really happy to have you here in committee and, and hear of the great work that Life After does. Um, I see your presentation up on screen and we have um, someone here. You can just say next slide and they can move on to the next slide. But I'm going to... Um, Give it over to yourselves, give your presentation, and I'll bring members in for uh, comments and questions afterwards, if that's okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Yep, if you want to go ahead, thank you. Um, so I'd like to introduce myself to those who don't know me. Um, my name is Debbie Mullen, and I am the Vice Chair of Life After, and I'm joined with Marie O'Brien, who is the Secretary of Life After. And we just want to take this opportunity today to give you um, a little insight into what our charity um, has attained in the last five and a half years since its inception. And uh, I suppose I should start by saying that I um, come from Limavati and I am a counsellor in practice and I would be the counsellor within Life After that would deliver the support services um, along with other of our volunteers within the group as well. I unfortunately lost my son uh, 10 years ago now on the 2nd of March due to a road traffic fatality on the outskirts of Limavati and as you can understand it was a life-changing and traumatic event for me and at that time there was really no support services available other than medication. Uh, what I found is as I went through my journey as becoming a counsellor, I was in my final year that year, that um, there wasn't specific support services available in our area and I happened to meet Christopher Sherrod, who is our person at a think tank, and he had already put together a group of people within Derry City and Strabane District who were interested in forming a steering committee and then a, a committee to run a support group. 
And from that, we have developed. Um, I'd like to now introduce you to Marie, and then we'll start the presentation. Hello, uh, I'm Marie O'Brien. I'm the Secretary of Life After. I lost my daughter, Kiva, on the 13th of October 2016 on the A5. And the following week, I um, lost my brother-in-law in, in a pedestrian accident in Newton Stewart, also on the A5. And I came into life after as a member looking for support. And it has gone now that I'm able to help other people going through the same thing. So that's why I'm in life after. Okay, Debbie. Okay. So we go to the next slide. I'm sure you maybe have a wee read through here, but I'll read through with you. And it just gives you a brief um, outline of life after and how we have formed um, so the next one here on the screen is that uh, we are a registered charity and we're made up of families, supporting families who unfortunately have suffered the loss of a loved one due to a road traffic collision. We are cu currently supporting families right across Northern Ireland, Donegal and the USA. At the moment, our numbers are, are at 192 families. Life After supports bereaved families in the aftermath of a fatal road traffic collision. We also promote road safety awareness, run road safety events and deliver educational presentations right across Northern Ireland. Our next slide. So Life After was formed, as I said, in 2017, when we identified that there was a lack of specialised support services being provided to our family and friends of those who have lost their lives through a road traffic collision, especially in the aftermath of such a traumatic event. A steering committee was formed with representatives from all our political parties, the PSNI, the PCSP and the Derry City Initiative. Um, this steering committee meets on a bi-monthly basis um, to discuss and forward plan for the charity and the areas of support identified. Life After has formed a voluntary committee made up of representatives of nine families who have formulated a constitution which expanded the remit of the charity to help and support the victims' families and to, to actively promote road safety and road user responsibility to help prevent further casualties on our roads. Next one. Initially, we provide a listening ear service and through our early intervention and assessment process, we can identify the individual needs of each family member. Now, this can be up to 12 to 15 family members, depending on how many uh, need our services within the family itself. We then up, draw up a plan that can help support and uh, with their mental health and emotional well-being to assist them coming to terms with such a life-changing and traumatic event. And some of the services that we provide are as follows. Counselling services are available specific to the traumatic nature of the person's loss. Home visits, telephone follow-ups, holistic services, advocacy services, court support, including preparation, attendance, support and aftermath support. And sometimes this court support could be three to four years in the aftermath of that fatal road traffic collision. We offer monthly family support meetings in various hubs right across Northern Ireland, including Derry City and Straban, Causeway Coast and Glens, Oma and Fermanagh, and Lisburn Council areas. So this will grow uh, in the future. And we have just had a meeting with Mid Ulster Council and we are planning a meeting with Donegal Council within the next couple of months. We have monthly online support meetings via Zoom. And we also um, formed a youth forum last year within Life After to help develop an ongoing strategy to ensure that their voices are heard and their needs are catered for also. We facilitate fun days, family outings and yearly services of remembrance and celebration at Christmas time. This is where families come together before Christmas to remember the lives of their loved ones and to celebrate the life that they had. The evening is attended by family members and friends and representatives of our local political parties, our clergy, the PSNI and emergency services. And it is hosted by the Mayor of Derry and Straban in the Guildhall in Derry, London Derry. 
Life After promote road safety awareness, working alongside the PSNI, Her Majesty's Prison Services, the PCSP, Emergency Services and Community and Voluntary Organisations. Throughout the year, this has included participation in RTC reenactments from a lived experience, school and youth talks. We coordinated a Road Safety Saturday um, uh, initiative uh, two years now running um, during Road Safety Week. We uh, liaise with the DFI for road improvements at accident and black spots and raising awareness of road safety issues. And we have been lobbying for improved justice around the sentencing for the victims of road traffic collisions. And we have planned and facilitated youth road safety conferences within the community organisation called Triax in Derry, London Derry in November 2022. Mm -hmm. And this brought 300 youths of sixth form age together in interactive workshops and education on all aspects of road safety. This accumulated for a reenactment also with support from our emergency services and our PCSP. We were also able to deliver to them from a lived experience um, how the impact had from a parental point of view as well. In recent years, we have been requested to attend the PS, uh, the, the, sorry, attend the PSNI during their monthly new family liaison officers training sessions. Here we deliver the new flows um, from a lived experience and from the impact of their role will have on a victim's family as they carry out their duties. From our lived experiences, we've been able to give them first-hand insight as to what families may endure when faced with such a traumatic and loss and give them guidance in providing victim support by way of constructive feedback from our, from our own family experiences. We also brief the family liaison officers about our services and suggest that they signpost families to us as there is no other organisation delivering this level of support in Northern Ireland. This in turn takes the pressure off the flows by diverting the need to support us, reducing the demand on them. Life After started with five families based in the Derry area, and we now support over 192 families right across Northern Ireland, and this number is continually growing. We support families in the Republic of Ireland along the, our border counties. We also support a family in the USA who lost their family member on her roads while visiting Northern Ireland on their honeymoon. Since becoming involved with the PSNI flow training, demand to our support services has increased by 70% last year alone. This may also be due to the increased numbers of fatal RTCs, especially in the summer months, and our catchment area has increased also. We deliver 300 hours of therapeutic counselling in 2021, and in 2022, it was over 500. Moving forward, as our charity grows, we are in the process of building a bank of trained volunteers and counsellors to avail of as and when we require them. Our mission statement, Life After strives to support any bereaved family member who requires such support in the aftermath of a fatal road traffic collision. As such, support will be delivered in a safe, professional and confidential manner and tailored to the individual need. Life After endeavours to educate, advise and inform around road safety education with the aim in helping reduce the number of fatal and serious road traffic collisions in Northern Ireland. Our vision statement is to ensure the most appropriate support is available and accessible to at the right time for those who are bereaved through a road traffic collision. It is also our vision that education and information will help reduce the numbers of fatal and serious road traffic collisions in Northern Ireland. We, the members of Life After, have also been quite actively involved in raising awareness for the need for the A5 to be to go ahead and we have attended those meetings in Gravahi as well and plan to help those families in that area to raise that awareness so that we can make a change. Thank you for listening. Debbie, thank you very, very much for that. I'm going to bring in the first speaker, uh, Councillor Tierney. Thank you, Chair, um, and thanks to Debbie and Marie. Um, for presenting this um, today on behalf of Life After. 
Um, I got a phone call on a Sunday evening um, in 2017, I remember it well, um, from a gentleman who I'd never met before, Christopher Sherrod, and he told me um, that about his idea of setting up an organisation to support people um, and families who were bereaved by road traffic accidents. Um, he told me a little bit about the practical um, issues um, around his own and his family's own individual story. Um, and then obviously um, some of the emotional difficulties that they faced as well in the aftermath um, of the loss of his father. I thought it was a fantastic idea. Um, and he asked me would I become involved on behalf of the SDLP, which I agreed. He then told me that I had to be in the CCA building at 10 o'clock the following morning for the first meeting. Um, and in there, um, in my view, um, there were five representatives of amazing families who had all come together um, and collaborated collaboratively to try and support people who were going through um, similar circumstances as them. And I think one of the strongest bulls they, they life after success story is the fact that it's run by people who have loved experiences. Um, and from that day where there were five families sitting around the table, um, I Personally, I'm delighted to see that it is now supporting 192 families um, across the north. It is extremely disappointing and extremely frustrating that we need an organisation like Life After, that there is no one else there um, to fill that gap. But I think it's it, it's amazing work that they do. Um, I know um, and have seen the organisation grow. Um, from then to now, and I know the importance and the, the amount of um, thought that they put on the, all of the work that they do, not only around supporting families, but also around um, road safety matters. This council took a decision yesterday um, around a one-way traffic system in uh, Fergie Street in Derry, um, and I know even from social media that that will please a lot of people in Derry, but none more so than the chairperson of Life After, who... Um, has since that has um, become a thing, had been um, campaigning for safer um, and better usage of the uh, road traffic system and then around uh, the fountain area. Uh, so I know that he'll be he'll be greatly pleased um, at that. You know, as a council um, and as individual elected representatives, I think we should be doing all we can to help life after, and I'm delighted. Um, that they're here today, and I'm genuinely delighted to be um, involved in, in, in their steering group. We, unfortunately, need organisations like Life After. We need people like Debbie, like Christopher Sherrod, like Marie and Rusty, um, and Bobby Bradley, and all those people um, who have unfortunately lost so someone um, on our roads. I know um, that it's, you know, the, the work... Um, that they put on the, the, the trying to promote um, around the A5. And I know that that's, Chair, where, where you initially um, met the organisation. And I know um, how close that is to many of the, the people connected um, to, to life after hearts. Um, I think we should be doing all we can. I think as a council, we should be promoting the services um, that life after offer. offer um, because there is that understanding, the empathy, um, and as I say, the, the, the loved experiences that each of the volunteers connected to that organization um, have, not only do they have that, they also, within life after then, become part of a family um, of people who have been uh, impacted by similar circumstances. And I know for many of the, of the users um, of life after that that gives them a certain um, piece of strength um, in seeing um, someone else who is slightly um, in front of them um, on their, their, their journey of grief. Um, and I know that that has given the families um, a lot of comfort and a lot of support. Whenever I was mayor, I was delighted. They, they, they host the, the Christmas um, service of remembrance. Um, it was something that, that, that I took great pride in, and I know um, other mayors um, before me um, and hopefully after me have as well. Um, so, look, my full support... Um, as always, to, to life after the, all the, the work that they're doing. But I think as a council, we should be now um, trying to promote 
the work that they do and trying to make sure that we're doing all we can to support them, support people who are going through a horrendous time. Uh, and once again, on behalf of the SDLP, thank you, Debbie and Marie, um, for, for coming here today and for all of the work that you do to support families right across um, our council area and further afield. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Councillor Cheney. Councillor Michaela Boyle. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I want to also thank uh, Debbie and Marie um, for being online today um, to give us their presentation and to thank Christopher and the other members of the um, Life After uh, for the work they do. Um, like Councillor Tierney, when I was mayor, um, one of my highlights was uh, hosting the service of remembrance uh, in the Guild Hall and getting to meet all the families, um, bereaved families, and um, listen to their stories um, of their loved ones and, and hearing firsthand exactly um, the work that Life After um, helped with those families and the interaction after um, an RTA and a sudden death. Um, uh, I also found it very comforting. I, I suppose coming from the Straban area, I wasn't really aware before I was mayor of the organisation. But my interaction with Christopher and others, um, um, it was very comforting for me because I lost a sister-in-law very suddenly and tragically in a road traffic accident in Straban. And even, you know, to talk to the individuals on the organisation uh, was much help to me and my family. Um, uh, it's great to see that they have the youth forum as well, too. Um, I want to commend them on the work that they're doing with with the, the youth um, uh, in our area and particularly the, the work that they're doing, not just right, right across the island of Ireland, but um, further afield, uh, USA as well, and and working with families and, and, and repatriating um, bodies and that. So I just want to say uh, also um, Marie and Rusty, um, particularly, uh, you know, the work that they have done in my area with families um, uh, as part of their organisation, because um, I hear it on the ground, we hear it outside, and um, families need that support and listening ear um, immediately um, after a death. Uh, they don't know who to turn to or they don't know where to go. And just to have that um, lifeline there um, for um, that immediate support is, is indeed um, very um uplifting for the families that they're there to hear um, what has went on and to be that conduit with the statutory bodies and agencies and services. Um, and it just takes that whole weight of worry and stress of families at that time of need. Um, so I'd just like to say, um, you don't need the luck, you have it because you know, it's a, a, in your mission statement, it's profound uh, where you have come from to where you are now. And unfortunately, it is because of the number of deaths that we have on our roads here, um, particularly on the A5. And I want to commend you on the work that you are doing in that regard. But um, as a council, and I know I could probably speak for every member of council, we do thoroughly support the work that you are doing because it brings immense um, comfort to families and our, our DEAs or our electoral areas, and and you provide a wonderful service. And it's one of the it's one of the organisations that I will always remember working with in my time as mayor um, because of the great work that you do. Um, so um, I just want to say best wishes to all of the members um, in the future and. You know, anything that this council can do to support you in that um, along the way, we're we're happy to be to be here, to be a listening ear to you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Michaela. Thank you, Councillor Boyle. The next indicated speaker is Councillor Doyle. Thank you, Chair. And, uh, thanks to uh, Debbie and Marie um, for their presentation and thanks for all the work that you do. Um, Brian mentioned uh, that your organisation began in, in 2017. Um, my party wasn't even formed in 2017, so um, uh, we, we haven't had the opportunity to, to engage, but I hope that we will, certainly in the future. I have to say, there isn't a day that now I uh, log on to social media that 
life after hasn't got one of <laughs> isn't one of the top posts that I see. Um, I think it's uh, it Sheridan that that looks after that, and it's fairly evident from the the glowing report that you've got from previous speakers that the work that you do is really valuable. Um, you know, I, I most people will know this, but I, I used to work for uh, an MLA uh, a number of years ago who lost a family member um, in a uh, road traffic collision. Um, and I, I know the the hurt and the, the grief that's there. Um, and, you know, to be able to offer that service is, of course, something we would wish that, um, you know, the health service would be able to do for everyone. But, um, you know, it, it, it pains me to think that there would be no service there at all. And it's, it's you know, I'm sure there are people who are um, including you in their prayers at night because you've, you've helped out so much. And I think that's um, something that's very special and it's fairly obvious from even social media, the, the comments that I see that people see the group as something very special. Um, so I just wanted to commend the work that you're doing. Um, I really enjoyed the presentation. And as Councillor Boyle said before me, you know, we're all here to, to support you. And certainly if there's anything that I can do on an individual basis, um, I'd be delighted to, to help out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, Councillor Ferguson. Thank you, Chair, and uh, hello, Debbie and Marie. How are you? Uh, hello, Rachel. <laughs> I hope you are keeping well. Um, I think it's amazing to have you here and presenting because I, I know only too well. Um, back in 2015, we were one of those families that were woke that morning to find out we'd lost a loved one um, and lost a loved one on the, the, the south um, side of the border. So it became very complicated and it was a very long and drawn out process for that family. But I know that my family members are part of your steering group and they help try and find policies and ways and training. I know there's there's a whole agenda of how you step in that space now whenever there is cross-border collaboration. So the work that you do is just amazing. I, I say this with a heavy heart. It's amazing that you're supporting 192 families that so will never have to go through that alone again. But it's so sad that there's 192 families that have to deal with that pain. Uh, and I know you are part of that. Um, the, the, the road safety events that you do are out of this world. They raise so much awareness. The, the training with the flows, you know, is just amazing step forward, you know, that these people are getting this lived experience to take the families when they go out and they knock on that door and they deliver that awful message. Um, and even tackling the justice system. I know you have met with my party recently, trying to bring up a, a few of those issues, the justice system and that long road and trying to get prosecution. So the, from joining council in 2019 and to see where you are now, you, back then we were trying to get charity status. Right now you are flying and I mean, you are just growing so quickly and it's amazing. It's, and it's down to yourselves, it's down to Christopher and it's down to the other family members that are all in there pushing as hard as they can. So I, I can't thank you enough and I'm just glad that you are here today to kind of relay your message. So hopefully more families will find out that you're there. More people know that you're there and, and get, reach out and get that service. But so well, from my heart, thank you so much, both of you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ferguson. Alderman Devaney. Thank you, Chair, for uh, allowing me in. And just can I welcome Debbie and Marie in, in to the, the, the committee meeting today and uh, I suppose um, when this all kicked off a number of years ago it was getting the, about getting the message out there um, that this help was available and I do agree with some of the rest of the speakers and um, the, the group did fill a void there that probably our health service should have been delivered but look you have come a, a really really long way and when you look at the committee that's built in around there a lot of the members who are involved in the committee, maybe all of them, ha, you know, have lived that unfortunate experience of losing a loved one due to an RTA, and uh, it, it is good. And look, you have come a long, long way. And look, the information is out there now, very, very clearly, that uh, if somebody goes through that difficult trauma, that life after is here to help, and that good work um, needs to be carried on. And I do believe. We as a council should be doing that we all that we can to support the organization and you know at the very start i always talk you, you have to um, creep before you walk and then you start to run i do believe this organization now is through the creeping and walking stages it is really now into the running stages and you know i have to say 
delivering that vital help, very, very vital help for those loved ones who lose um, loved ones due to a, a road traffic accident and feel they have nowhere to go. But there, that the information is out there now that Life After is here to support you. But well done, and I wish you all the very success and wish you well in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Morris. Uh, next week, Councillor Harkin, go ahead. Thank you, Chair, and uh, uh, welcome to the Life After representatives, and thank you for taking the time today to come in here and uh, do the presentation. And I, I think, as all our uh, councillors and aldermen have said, your work is uh, you know, very well acknowledged, and, and you're very, very active. And you have done a lot to, to raise awareness about um, you know, road traffic deaths and I think that your work in terms of helping people through the trauma of that is excellent. Uh, people need support, they need help uh, when they're facing that kind of tragedy and you have done a lot of excellent work. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I and we commend you for, for your work there. Um, Look, our, our, our roads uh, and discussions about our roads have been in the news a lot lately, uh, whether it's been the kind of unacceptable potholes right across our district and right across the north. Um, We've talked about like the lack of lighting in a lot of areas uh, of our roads. We've talked about the fact that major road developments haven't been finished, um, and uh, you know there is issues as well about trying to discourage people from from using cars and using more public transportation. And when we when we when we uh, and that's why developing our rail network um, is so important, and our and our bus network as well, uh, so that people have all their options. Um, so that that is uh, that's very much at the forefront of what we do in terms of trying to create a context where uh, fewer and fewer and fewer people are put at risk. Uh, you know, even one person, uh, you know, losing their life uh, on our roads is unacceptable um, because that is a you know that is a life uh, that is a family life that is turned upside down. Um, so I think that this uh, this discussion uh, and the awareness you bring to this issue. Uh, definitely focuses minds, uh, and we look forward to working with you on, uh, you know, bringing about policy change in the future. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Harkin. And final speaker is Alderman Guy. Uh, thank you, Chair, for letting me in. And I just want to thank Debbie and Marie coming on to present today. Um, thanks very much for the presentation. Uh, and if, Definitely on that highly commendable work which Life After, Life After Group uh, carry out within the area and across, right across Northern Ireland. And also for the, the endless um, lobbying of our councillors and MLAs and MPs to make our roads safer and you know, deal with loss of life on our roads and so on. And I know it's not easy for you, and you are speaking from uh, experience, but you do a great job and uh, he's very well done on it. But thanks for coming on today. Thanks, Kinder. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman. Guy, I think he was the last speaker. David Marie, there's nothing really more that I could say that the committee have been already already said. And I think the fact that you have grown to support um a hundred and ninety-two families is absolutely amazing. And with your plans to expand on that, it's it's even better. And you know, it's it's testament to the work you, you are doing. And like you say, there's no other organization providing the support and the lobbying and having the events around uh, road safety that you are having and in my view i suppose i, I know a big campaigner of the a5 but in my view like we campaign for you know potholes and stuff but not we're not always focused i suppose uh on road safety upgrades you know you think of potholes you think of upgrading carriageways and so on but you are at the forefront of that which is which is very very Welcome and and looking at the stats for today, like fifty five people died on our roads last year, and that's fifty five extra families who are suffering that loss. And to have um, an organisation like yourselves to, to turn to, where they can turn to nowhere else, you know, our health services is, is absolutely bung. To have you stairs, I think is absolutely um, great. Um, I was I was thinking as well in terms of today's committee, um, how we could best. You, you obviously have the full support of this committee and of of council. I was thinking how best we could um, support yourselves, especially in the, in the short term, Debbie. So um, I've asked uh, our director here that our council's media team and the community safety team link in with yourselves so we can help uh, support 
um, especially when you have campaigns and so on, that we can help promote you and support you across this district. So but we'll get them to, to get in touch with you and, and I suppose spread the word as much as we can um, to make sure that those families know that they have someone to turn to when they suffer that loss. And I hope that's okay, Debbie Marie. Yes, we'd be very appreciative of that because it, it very much is about getting the word out there. And as much as we have 192 families right now, and, and in many ways, we don't want more new family members, but we know that the need is out there. And we have people out there. It, it doesn't have to be a fatality that has been recent. We have people in life after that the fatality was quite a number of years ago, but they just didn't get the support services at that particular time. But um, we just want people to know that there is a service now. It is there, it is free, and it is available to them. And there's also no time limit to that um, support. Um, just like Brian had said earlier, we are a family. And once you become part of life after, there is always somebody there for you at any turn of event. Because unfortunately, what we have to understand is that, you know, the trauma that we have, um, unfortunately, um, ha have had to endure is lifelong. And uh, the bereavement that comes with that is quite life altering. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, sometimes it's important for us to educate people along that as well. It's not a quick fix of medication. It's not six sessions from a counsellor through your GP practice. It takes much more than that for us to build our lives back and to gain some sort of life after the loss that we have had. And that's the message that we're trying to put across to other people that there, there is a life after and it's a different life. But it is a life worth living and it is a life that you can find comfort and support in. But I just want to take a moment to just say to thank you, each and every one of you, for taking time out of your day to allow us to present to you because we know that it's vital for us to raise our awareness in every part of Northern Ireland and indeed into the Republic of Ireland as well. So thank you very much for taking the time out today. No problem at all. Debbie, it's been absolutely um, our pleasure, and as I say, we'll, we'll get those council officers. That hope they'll, hopefully, they'll be in, in, in touch as, as soon as possible. Um, but thank you so much for coming on behalf of the committee. I really, really do appreciate it. And thanks for the great work, yes, sir. Yes, sir, Dan. Uh, thank okay. you, Stephen, for inviting us. No problem at all, Marie. Privilege. Yeah, we're we're going to um or move on to oh, wait a minute. You have probably got better things to do on Thursday evening to yeah. listen to us, but. Uh, I'll let you uh, you strap off there, and we'll we'll, okay. we'll banter on. And uh, thanks very much, and we'll speak soon again. Thanks, Stephen. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, I'm going to move on to item five, which is chairperson's business. And I have five items that we're going to raise and try and keep them as brief as possible. But the first person to contact me was Councillor Ferguson. Um, Rachel, if you want to go ahead there. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for allowing me to come in under Chair's business on that. Chair, I know a number of our members have been contacted by the Donegal Dairy Vapors American football team. They're currently, over the last eight years, they've been a well, nomadic club moving from the YMCA, YMCA after flooding and since have been using pitches and grace to Nama Valley, Donny and Dairy Gall. I know they've kind of reached out because they're they're trying to find a resolution with our current council policy where they can't train on grass pitches. And I was hoping that we I could possibly propose a meeting with ourselves, the members and the officers. It doesn't have to be three committee, but um, a, a, a meeting, even like a working group, just to kind of see if there's a way in which we can go forward. They have raised a few number of issues where um, the other councils have been able to accommodate on grass pitches, and I know they would love to have access more to Temple, more sports complex. So, Chair, if I could just propose at some point that we could have um, a meeting with council officers and, and committee members with the Donegal Dairy um, Vipers, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, Barry, you want to come in? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, just for members' information, I think um, I've been on to Councillor Farrell and Councillor Doyle on this particular issue in the last, probably the last month, members, in terms of we have been working with, with the club over, since pre-COVID. Um, the club were facilitated in City of Derry um, Rugby Club, um, but that, that seems to have been terminated now. So Councillor Ferguson's right um, in terms of 
grass pitches. The, the, the knock-on effect of providing one club with access to grass pitches for training is that we'd have to open, open it up to all our clubs, um, soccer, Gaelic, rugby, and we have a huge, huge demand for training across all codes. Um, I think I'd presented the members previously about the growth in female participation has actually further exacerbated our issue around our lack of pitches in, in order to meet need or demand. So, um, look, we're happy to take it forward. We have provided 4G, 3G to the club. We have told them that they can they can get access to Templemore for competitive games. They, did, they didn't follow our advice in terms of submitting within the booking process like all other clubs within the district do. Um, so um, in terms of meeting with the club, I think I have probably 20 requests from clubs about training as well. So I think we would need to meet with all clubs across all codes if we're going to be you know, looking at providing um, facilities because we do have a huge demand on all our facilities, Councillor Ferguson, and uh, um, we have probably in the last 18 months that has doubled just because of the, the growth of female sports. So um, we're happy to work away with this club. And I think our sports development team have told them that we will get them access to the Templemore uh, grass pitch for, for Gaelic in terms of their competitive games. And we can provide call 3G on a regular basis to them as well for, for their training purposes. But outside of that, I don't have any other options from a grass pitch point of view. The, the one knock-on effect, if we do open up our grass pitches for training, that will mean that, unfortunately, competitive games at the weekend, Saturdays and Sundays, will have to be cancelled at this time of year because of the, the state of the pitches. We can't we can't facilitate training and play on all our pitches at present. Councillor sure. Ferguson, do you want to come back in? Are you happy to respond? No, that's fair enough, Barry. I, I thought it was going to be that, that issue, but I thought even if we had a meeting to kind of go through with them, if there was issues with booking, and I know they, they have similar concerns to what we're seeing with the football teams with the 3G and the 4G pitches causing more um, injuries from their players, but it was just more to kind of um, lay out what, what we could possibly do, where we could go, whether if they did want to use a, a uh, 3G, 4G pitch for training and how to book. But if you're saying that that would have to open up to all the other clubs, I, I take that on board and I'll take that back to them. Um, uh, I'm sure I can take it offline with you if that's okay. Yep. Thank you, Councillor Ferguson. Councillor Doyle on same issue. Yeah, same issue, Chair. And you know, Rachel has has outlined the the I think the information that I, I think a number of us got uh, from the club, and I appreciate the effort that Barry has put on. In coming back to me a few times about this um look i mean as rachel said there you know if, if this is an issue of you know the, the system is is overloaded almost um then you know we do have limited options what i would say is always you know i i do think and i think barry if i'm not mistaken you, you mentioned there that maybe either your officials have met or will meet with the club um i think it would even you know on a non non-formal basis if a few members have who've been contacted could go to that as well. Um, because I have to say I'm no expert about the pitch booking system for for obvious reasons, but um in terms of learning a bit more about that, in terms of what flexibility we can build into maybe a future system, I think that would be really helpful. Thank you. Are you happy to take that on, set up a meeting? Yeah, we are we have uh we have regular dialogue with the club um, within our sports development pitches team. So the next the next meeting that we organise, we'll invite the, the members that have contacted us directly in. You know, the, there's no difficulty with sitting. We'll be giving the same message as we're giving members today. If we, I think if we had another 20 pitches, we still wouldn't be able to, to facilitate the demand we currently have across the district uh, because of the growth of sport, which is a good thing. But um, look, we'll, we'll try our best to facilitate the club as, as and where we can. Happy with that, Councillor Very much so, Chair. Okay, no problem. The next um, item is from, or next member, sorry, is Alderman Hussey wanted to raise an issue under Chair's business. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, Chair. I'm not a member of committee. Uh, but uh, at the committee's last meeting, uh, cuts were considered with uh, uh, with regard to um, SWA and the Western Trust consultation that was agreed to respond to that consultation. Uh, I did try to bring the matter up um, under Mayor's business, uh, two issues, and, and the Mayor suggested that I bring it to this committee. I, I have a proposal which I cannot propose, 
So I, I'm I'm sort of looking for somebody to propose it on my behalf in committee. Pardon? Correct. Uh, it's already uh, with the uh, Secretariat, so if it can go up. Uh, it's basically asking, um, the Western Trust have held uh, a series of public consultations uh, throughout Fermanagh OMA and all of the DEAs. There is an impact, uh, as, as you know yourself, Chair, specifically on our own southern DEAs, uh, plus the, the knock-on impact that this will have on Altna Galvin through its services. Uh, so I'm simply asking that Council would make contact with the Trust and ask them to establish a public consultation in the southern part of of our council area, which should be Newton Stewart, Castle Derg, wherever. Uh, I, I think they've afforded that to the residents of Fermanagh Oma. They should be as forthcoming to the residents who would be more impacted from our council area. And I think given the recent fears now with the cuts to emergency surgery impacting on maternity services, uh, it becomes an increasing issue that we need to we need to be considering. So, if, if members are content and somebody's prepared to propose it, I, I rest my case. Sure. Thank you, Alderman Hussey. It's been proposed by Councillor McGinley and seconded by Councillor Ferguson. Yep. Uh, the next speaker on the motion is Alderman Kerrigan. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Chair. And, and I thank Alderman Hussey for raising it. And as he said, it's dead state. Had, he had raised it before, but it was tasked to be brought back to health and communities. And again, this event, uh, or sorry, consultation within the DAIR, DEA or DEA uh, chair, would, would be of benefit because, as is stated, you know, it is a hospital whereby the, major, you know, the majority in this castle there again, depending on what side of the town you are, you're sent towards the Swa rather than Alton Galvin. Um, as I say, there have, they have afforded. Um, Excuse me. They have afforded uh, individual DEAs uh, uh, throughout the Fermanagh OMA. So, as I say, particularly with the DERG uh, being connected with it, I feel that it is it's, it's the right course of action. So, if that could be tasked, you know, I know the consultation. It's uh, the time is running out on it as well. I know it still goes on to March, and there are online events. But still, I think if there was, if we could push for something in Castle Derg, preferably, but should be Newton, wherever it be, so if we get something in the Derg DEA, that'll be of much benefit. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Alderman Kerrigan, Councillor Tierney. Chair, thank you. Um, and it was just a, um, I suppose, formally proposed um, on behalf of Alderman Hussey um, due to the technicality, and I don't think we should allow a technicality to get in the way of something um, as important. So. I'm happy that um, this proposal is able to, to come before us and we're able to quickly discuss it and hopefully um, everybody support it. Um, in the proposal, it talks about the southern part of Derry City and Strabane District Council and I can understand why that's there because it will impact um, on more people in, in that part of the council area. Uh, so this isn't me having a, a Derry Strabane type um, argument. It will also, and we've been told this by the Trust, it will also have an impact on people right across this council area and further afield um, who currently use, when they need the Altna Galvin, because it's going to have an added impact um, on the, the services that they're able to provide um, at ED. So th there are issues right across this council area, but I think as a starting point, it is a good idea to have the, the public consultation to begin with in the southern part, as, as it says there, of, of this council area. We should be doing all we can um, to protect services um, both within and um, outside of, of this council that have an impact on people um, from our council district. So for, on behalf of the SDLP, we're, we're happy to support it. But I think we, and I know the, the Trust have done like a, a DEA sort of round robin type thing in, in Fermanagh and Oma. I don't know if that would be as successful in Derry and Straban because people won't probably pick up that this is going to have an impact on them at Alton and Galvin. They will see it as a Fermanagh Oma type issue. But I think as elected representatives having been told by the Trust that this is going to have an impact, then we need to be keeping across this. And I think as a starting point, we should be looking at that southern part. But once this does become an issue, hopefully it doesn't. Um, but if it does become an issue for Alton and Galvin, um, we need to be across that. Thank you, but happy to support the proposal. Thank you, Councillor Tierney. Councillor Harkin. 
Yeah, people before profit are happy to support this proposal too. And uh, sometimes these types of consultations are, are box ticking exercises uh, and decisions are already made. But that's not the case here because this is a very active fight. I mean, the future of the SWA is a huge issue uh, for you know everybody in the in the areas affected, and that includes in this district. So, uh, if the trust holds another consultation in our district area, um, I think that that's good for democracy. It also gives people the opportunity to let the trust know in no uncertain terms how they feel about this. I would certainly encourage people from our district to go to it. Uh, if, they're, if the trust agrees to it, I don't see why they shouldn't. Uh, they should give people the opportunity to, to, to um, uh, say what they think, um, and, and th that'll be a good opportunity. Uh, and and it all, it's also an acknowledgement as well of the of the impact and the um, area that the that the SWA actually uh, uh, will have implications for. So uh, we support the proposal. Thank you, Councillor Harkin. Councillor McGinley. Omega chair and, and I'll be brief and I just want to say that I, I appreciate Alderman Hussey respecting my ruling as the chair of governance and strategic planning. I said I asked I had asked him to bring this to health and communities as I felt that it was a more appropriate committee for the proposal. Um which is why I'm happy and was happy to propose it on his behalf as a member of this committee. Um I think it's important that voices within our district are heard in relation to the consultation. Um and I just think that we all need to be fighting to protect um, the services within our health service. Um, so thank you, Alderman Hussey, for bringing this uh, forward, and we're more than happy to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McGinley. Yep. And just a few words myself, Alderman Hussey. I do thank you for bringing this. It, it's a big issue. Um, and last, I think the last month's meeting I raised on the Chair's business, the uh, importance of the SWA and the the big impact these um, cuts would have in emergency services, especially um, even um, an out and gallop, putting more pressure on them. It's concerning, and um, we spoke earlier, earlier Alderman Hussey, to learn of the, the further um, threats to maternity services. And I know it's been, and their stroke services has been uh, under threat in the past as well. And it seems like the fight's never ending here, but, uh, you know, it's complete solidarity with those campaigning um, against these cuts and with Unison and our local Unison chair as well, who's kept me um, up to date with with developments. But um, thank you for bringing the proposal on. But I'll say here unanimous support for. It. So we're going to take it as past. Do you want to sum up anything? Um, just, a, <clears throat> just to say um, uh, thank you to all who have pulled in behind this, and I appreciate those who have brought uh, you know agreed to the proposal being brought forward. Thank you, chair. Thank you, Alderman Hussey. Okay, we'll take that motion as passed, members. Members, the next item of Chair's business is Councillor Sinoy Bayer to contact me. Lillian, if you want to go ahead there. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me to speak on this issue. <clears throat> I think, members, it's impossible to have been anything other than horrified by the devastating earthquake that has hit southern Turkey and southern Syria, killing thousands of people and reducing buildings to rubble. I suspect it will be some time before we learn the full extent of the death and destruction cost. And um, the rescue effort has been made even harder by the cold and the cold weather and significant damage to infrastructure in both countries. And it was really heartening to see the vigil for Turkey and Syria outside the guild hall on Tuesday night and had there not been a meeting clash. I have no doubt everyone here would have been there too. And this was a really good example of dairy people doing what they always do, expressing solidarity and sympathy. But people need urgent aid to survive. And on Tuesday at the Business and Culture Committee, Members spoke about the need to find practical ways to support those severely affected. And like all of us, I've been thinking about how we can best provide practical support and especially how we as a council can best facilitate this. This morning, I attended a meeting organized by the Muslim Council of Britain in collaboration with aid organizations working with Turkey and Syria. And they have requested that physical donations are not sent to Turkey. There's always a natural 
and completely understandable tendency for people to want to donate things like clothing and other goods, although on a purely practical level, that's not necessarily that helpful as these goods would then need to be transported to Turkey and Syria. And the Muslim Council of Britain has said that the cost of storage and transport in most cases is more than the value of these items and that cash can be used to buy the same items from the local community or the local economy and gives local charities on the ground their flexibility to spend on what is most needed to support those affected. Uh, with the Muslim Council of Britain and other charities have requested the general public and those who wish to help to consider mobilizing communities to fundraise. And I think this council can also play a key role in mobilizing and organizing communities through a fundraising appeal using the council facilities and also the infrastructure that we have around our city and district. I'm therefore keen that we focus on collecting financial donations that can be passed quickly to local charities on the ground who can put it to best use. And it's safe to assume that things like food, medical supplies, nappies for children and materials for putting roofs over people's heads are needed, but there may be other things that we haven't thought of and I'd always prefer to let those directly involved in the rescue and relief effort make those decisions rather than us trying to second guess what's needed from afar. So I have a proposal for the committee to consider and I'll just put it there at the chat now. Can I do a sector for proposal? Councillor Tierney. Okay, we'll get that up on screen, Lillian. Thank you. Lillian, before we go on, I'm going to give, um, if, if you're done, if, if you if you want to continue, it's okay as well, but I'm going to give members a few minutes to, to consider your proposal. Um, if that's okay, we'll get it up on screen, Lillian. But if you have more to Thank you. please go ahead. If, if you want to continue, go ahead as well. No, it's just, uh, the main thing is that we act quickly and that we provide an easy means by which residents can coordinate with confidence that that can donate with confidence that and that their money will quickly find its way to the areas that needs needs it and i think council can take a lead on that thanks chair thank you so, you know, i'm going to give members a few minutes to look and consider the proposal so we'll take a few minutes members
Yep, Councillor Harkin, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you to Councillor Sinoy Barr for bringing the proposal, and I think I think what's happened, obviously, in the you know in Turkey and Syria is is, is uh, absolutely devastating, and it was good that we had the vigil here, and I and I uh, commend the mayor for opening up a book of condolences, and I think that uh, the Syrian, Turkish, and Kurdish communities that live in our district. Uh, know that there is a tremendous amount of uh, support for them and solidarity. And um, I think we should be doing everything we can um, to make sure that there is as much relief help that goes there as possible, because it is devastating and, and the news only gets work and worse each day as the, as the number of dead uh, claims and, and we see uh, the a full picture of the devastation. Um, at the vigil, there was a couple of different uh, organizations uh, announced by people who are familiar with organizations in both Turkey and Syria. Um, so I'm trying to, I, I, I support the proposal in the sense that we want to facilitate uh, people in our district being able to help in whatever way they can. I guess the only question I have is the coordination part, mm -hmm. because I don't, I, I'm not sure about the council creating another layer in order for people to give, because so this is a question, really. Maybe if if if, uh, if uh, uh, Lillian would be willing to kind of clarify what she means by uh, coordinate, I could see us doing something like providing a list of organisations that we think we should give to, and getting that up on our social media, uh, and getting that out from the mayor, and doing a launch event or something like that, so that people know if you want to give, these are the organisations. This is the different types of giving that you can do. That would help sim simplify it for people because I think that people are probably look. There's individuals that are collecting money, and I know that it's going to a good purpose. But a lot of people might not be comfortable giving to that individual because they don't know them, um, or or organisations that are maybe small groups in different areas that people here are very familiar with that are doing brilliant work, but they're not going to reach the national level of uh, you know. So it might be best for us to put together uh, a list of organizations and get behind that as a council and say if you want to help here's what we can do in addition they are kind of appeals the government both you know the british government and the irish government to, to do all they can to kind of assess people so i i welcome the proposal I, I maybe we should just talk about what the best means is for us as a council to um to support the relief effort thank you councillor harkin Councillor see i'm going to give you an opportunity to respond there to Councillor Harkin's suggestion. Um, and I do have a list of other speakers after you that, that I do need to bring in. But Councillor Sinai Barry, if you want to go ahead. Thanks, Chair. I, I completely understand what Councillor Sean Harkin is saying. I do, I'll take members. I do remember in 2016, Council took an initiative in our city and district to collect funding to support the Syrian refugees who came to our city then. Um, I suppose we can use the same means and I'm sure that the Health and Communities Committee then were part of that or the director of programs was part of that initiative. So I'm, I'm proposing something very similar where council can actually take the lead. I, I can get also um, in terms of the communities around here that would want to come together and, and collect funding, but a more coordinated approach will actually help. And once we get this funding, that we could uh, provide it to the Disaster Emergency Committee. Maybe what we could do is council working in partnership with the Disaster Emergency Committee to ensure that they can facilitate our community. I think a council-led initiative will not only bring our community together, but will also ensure that all the funding that has been collected can actually go to those local um, charities via the Disaster Emergency Committee. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Sinobai. Given the concerns raised about the motion, I am going to, we're going to try and get Philip on the phone to give his legal opinion on it. Members, just to be prudent. But the next speaker is Alderman Guy. Go ahead. Thanks, Chair. Um, and thanks to uh, Councillor Sinai Barr for bringing this uh, proposal. Um, I support the basis of it. Um, 
but I have to agree with what Councillor Harkin has said before. Um, how much, you know, can, and I suppose we're within on Phillips, uh, you know, confirmation on this, but how much can council get involved? I know you can put a bucket at a reception desk and people can put cash in, but what do you do with, uh, you know, card payments and stuff like that there, which is mainly the way things are these days. Um, I know from running, I mean, my colleague, are up and running uh, would help from all our councillors as well for their Ukrainian appeal. And I know how much of a headache that was. Now, we we basically were doing physical um, and we sent three l lorries away. Um, however, we also got cash donations. Now, at the time, we were warned off using certain people or certain groups to actually uh, transfer the cash because we were... Well, not that there was anything wrong doing or anything, but it was just because of the way they were set up that 100% of the cash would not reach the Ukrainians uh, because they would take their own cut of it. There was a local man who worked with um, uh, uh, Romanian uh, kids and stuff like that there and always got the money out to them, uh, the full amount. Now, obviously, different part of the world, but... Um, he was used a lot there to, to put money out into the Ukraine. I don't know. I'm sure there, there's there's um, this Muslim group. I'm sure they, they probably are uh, the same. They probably get the 100% out. But we need to know these questions before we actually would ask council to actually share who would be the best person to transfer uh, cash sums out to the affected area. Uh, I, I don't actually remember the Syrian one, how council went about that. But happy to support in the business, and if whatever follow-up comes back with, I'm sure uh, nobody will, will uh, be against this one. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Alderman Gay. Next speaker, Councillor Boyle. Thank you, Chair. Um, I I was speaking to uh, our Mayor this morning, and um, I do know that she has been in contact with the Turkish Embassy already um, in relation to assisting local communities um, that have um, been bore the brunt of this terrible earthquake in, in Turkey and Syria. Um, I, 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 I mean, I understand the sentiment around uh, Councillor Sinai Barr bringing this, fo this motion forward, and I, I'm sure we all would agree with her. But I think, I think in terms of the work that's already ongoing, across the city and the district and they are a number of major charities out there uh, that are already um, collecting um, and uh, I know uh, our mayor has already said that she will do everything in her um, power to promote that through our channels um, within council. Um, so um, I, I suppose just in terms of the council to coordinate um, if I could bring uh, forward a slight amendment um, uh, chair, um, just that the council to take out the the council coordinate to um, the council work with the existing charities, uh, you know, and to to promote their local fundraising efforts. If that's okay, and I can't write that on the chat box. Sorry, because I'm not on the. But I, I, as I said, I, I speaking to the mayor today in relation to this, and I do know that council has already been on to the Turkish embassy via the mayor's office, um, and um, we have pledged that we will support in terms of what we can do. But I don't think you know. I, and as I said, I get where uh, councillor Barr is coming from, but um, we we don't want to duplicate what's already going on across the city. In terms of fund fundraising, and and also I know previously we have collected for refugees coming to the city, um, you know, in terms of you know that versus sending money out, you know, and there might obviously be some legal logistics there that we we, we might not be able to do that, but that's the amendment. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, there. Councillor Boyle, and see Councillor McGinley has seconded your amendment. Next speaker is Alderman Kerrigan. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me in. And uh, it's it's uh, it's a tragedy what has happened in in, in Turkey and Syria. And your heart does go out to them, the, the devastations there. But uh, this uh, 
on 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 a lighter note, if you want to put in that regard, this is one of the occasions where I am agreeing with the comments and sentiments there made by Councillor Harkin, which doesn't often occur. But uh, it, it, it's very much the case of uh, any anything that I have dealt with, whereby you're adding an extra layer on that, always causes problems. You you know uh, there is the 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 I see the information in regard to the Turkey area earthquake appeal. I see that on the Disasters Emergency Committee. I have no issue with with promoting the supporting or promoting that appeal if that's where it's to go. Because ultimately, from my reading of it, was that we were we would coordinate raising money, but we were just giving the money to the Disaster Emergency appeal. We're adding an extra layer, and and that that causes problems. And any other realm of things that you work with, there's always issues. Uh, but as I say. No issue at all. Should it be the case that we're promoting it on social media? Should it be the case that we have collections, uh, physical collections at, at the Stavan Chamber and at, at the Guild Hall? There, there's no no problem in the like of that. Uh, and just and a slight query there um, in, in regards to Michaela's amendment there. I've, I've, we've no, no major issue. And just for clarification in my own mind here, um, I'm assuming these local charities, I, I'm assuming here that the local charities are the, subsequently again, provide money or putting money effectively through the, the Disaster Emergency Committee appeal. Eventually, is that where it's going? Or, is, or you know, as, as Hatt has already mentioned later in the motion, are they not? Have they had separate, a separate, um, a, se a separate way that they are getting the, the, their funds to the affected areas? It's just the case of, <coughs> if it's that, and we're assisting with promotion of monies, uh, uh, you know, who decides which charities will promote more, who decides Who's getting more of the money that may well be raised in council facilities? You, you know, it's just, it's just, uh, uh, you, you know, as I say, fully support the sentiment of the motion, but it's just kind of there's a few wee unanswered things in there. But as I say, I've, I've, it's, it's how we tidy that up, uh, chair, as as the issues in it there. So as I say, I've no problem promoting the existing appeal that is out there, but uh, it's it's uh, for as I say, your heart does go out to the people there that and the suffering that's taken and the death toll is is. You know, it's only a fraction at this stage, in my view, here of where where it will end up. Um, so it's it's a real devastation. But it's 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 how we can best get the money to it. And I say, as 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 Councillor Sino by has raised, money it is what's required. Uh, but it's it's how we get that promoted better. So as I say, um, I'm content enough with Michaela's amendment, but just a couple of queries there as to a wee bit of clarification on that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Alderman. We still don't have Philip um on the line to give clarification but we'll see um after the next speaker if he's on or not um alder mccarrigan councillor chair you want to go ahead thank you chair um and it's just on the amendment um from from councillor boyle we're happy enough to, to support it um we can um understand um people's um concern concerns around uh what that might look like um so we're happy enough um that council works with the existing charities um to, to, to try and do this this was about and I think Councillor Harkin sort of touched on it. This was about um, making sure that people across this district knew, um, first and foremost, um, that that help and support was needed um, and knew in a coordinated way um, how they best um, from here um, could support people um, affected um, by, by the terrible events. Um, and that's what, what this was about. So I don't think that the amendment in, in, in very many ways changes a lot of that. Um, and changes the, the purpose of it. I think it um, commits council, obviously, to work with those um, that are already in that field trying to support people. So we're happy enough um, to try and support it. I think, you know, this motion will do, um, and the work and the support will do an awful lot to help people um, who have been um, totally devastated by by, by the events um, that, that have happened. And... If that is something that we have to spend a wee bit of time here to talk about and, and to make sure that we've got the wording right, then that's something I think what we should do. But we're happy enough um, with the amendment. And I also think, you know, it's not very often that we see the DUP and people for profit agreeing um, on anything. So the fact that we're that we're even doing that, um, I think, is positive. And I say that in a, in a flippant manner. Um, but no, in all seriousness, with the amendment, um, I think it still will allow the same sentiment coming from the motion um, and it may just put some people's um, queries to bed. The, 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 it was discussed there around the, the 2017 effort and, and, and how that had worked. Um, that was, as I recall, um, a mayor's initiative at that particular time um, and I know 
um, that there was a lot of work put on to making sure um, that that initiative was rolled out properly and it was legally sound and all of that. Um, so this will, will hopefully come at Council to doing the same and will be the, the precursor for and the starting pack for um, this work to be done and for people from here to know um, that if the information is coming from Council, that where and how they can donate, then that information is sound and they know that 100% of their donation is getting to exactly where it needs to get to. And I think at the end of that, um, if we can all get that done, that's the, the, the end goal on this. So in relation to the amendment, we're happy enough to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tierney. And I think that's everyone, I think, um, that wanted to contribute. Yep, Alderman Hussey, go ahead. No, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, as Councillor Sinobar knows, I, I did also speak to this when it was brought up in the previous committee. And I, I welcome the, the changes that have been made to the beginning of it, but that the end bit is still there as well, because what I did caution at the time was avoid this knee-jerk reaction and remember that this is something that is going to be with us for months and years in, in that community. Uh, I would say for weeks, uh, maybe longer, dead bodies are going to be coming out of buildings, etc. Families are going to be distraught out there. I welcome the inclusion within that, that finances would go to organisations and, and, and businesses indeed in the affected region so that that can feed back into that and, and kickstart or re help to get that economy going within the region. Uh, one thing that I did hear uh, on news was that, in, I, I don't know if it was Syria or Turkey, uh, but communities had been paying an earthquake tax, earthquake tax, but they weren't getting anything back from that. And I heard that in the news and I thought, what's going on here? So we need to be careful too because uh, Councillor Harkin will agree fully. Government sometimes will take fundings but not uh, utilise the fundings for what they were originally taken. Uh, so I, I welcome that. Uh, one other thing perhaps Councillor Senior Boyer can uh, clarify with me. Uh, I know contact being made with the Turkish Embassy, I presume in Dublin or London. Uh, was any contact made uh, with the honorary? Uh, I'm not sure if he's ambassador or, or envoy, David Campbell. Uh, I've heard David speaking on, I know him quite well, and I know that he has a lot of knowledge of uh, Turkey itself as a society. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Alderman Hussey. Members, I'm here in unanimous support for the amendment. Um, I've heard no one go against. If you're happy enough, we can take the amendment as passed, members. Yep. Yep, we'll take the amendment as passed. On the substantive motion, um, Councillor Sinabai, do you want to come back in on the substantive motion? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks to all the members who have spoken on these issues. I think we can all agree that the scale of this is beyond our own imagination, and the more organisers we have in each community, the more we can help those who are in most need right now. I, I have no issue at all with any um, uh, the amendment. I think it actually adds on to, to make sure that we have an organised way of supporting this community. And as I said earlier, the main thing is that we act quickly, responsive, and that we provide an easy means by which our local residents can mobilize and support those who need that help now. And it might also be very useful for council officers to meet with the Disaster Emergency Committee. Uh, this is uh, a network of organizations that come together to respond to any disaster. They're very well experienced and they would guide on how we can best help, as well as how we can best facilitate our communities to come together to play their part. In terms of um, Adam and Hosey question, I'm not really sure if anyone has been asked for any advice. I think we've just heard from Councillor McKellar 
that uh, the mayor spoke to the Turkish government. Um, I'm very skeptical when it comes to government <laughs> also. This is why my focus is on the disaster uh, emergency committee because these are community organizations coming together to respond and support others within um, our, our countries really. So thank you and I hope we'll be able to do something positive in the coming days. Thank you, Councillor Sinai Bar, and thanks for raising the issue and, and the motion as well. And on it's very, very important um issue. It will take the substantive motion as possible. Well. No one wants to change your view. No. Okay, members, I'm gonna move on to actually I have another item in chair's business, which is in relation to item fifteen members. Members have been informed that although item 15 is an open business, there's additional um, information that should be considered um, in confidential. There's commercial uh, and legal sensitivities around additional information to item 15 in regards to the city of Bass and Derry. I'm going to propose that we take that item into confidential and get seconder members. I'm happy to second that, Chair. Councillor McGinley. Councillor McGinley, okay, thank you. Anyone of any or any anyone opposed to that? No. Nope. Okay, members. Um, I'm going to move on to item seven, which is matters arising from the open minutes of health and community committee mm -hmm. held on Thursday, the nineteenth of January, pages seventeen to thirty-six in your seventeen to thirty-six in your pack. Um, anyone of any items matters arising? No one's indicating. Okay, members, I'm going to move on to item eight, which is the universal basic income trial locations, pages 37 to 40 in your pack. Um, Una is meant to take, I don't think Una's on. Barry, are you taking it? Yep. You have it? Okay, Barry. Is Una here? Una, are you online? Chair, I've just literally joined. So <laughs> just in time. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. So you're taking item eight, Una? Yep. Yes, I am. Thank okay, you. perfect. Thank you. Um, members, I'm sure many of you are very familiar um, with the universal basic income. We've had several papers now that have come forward in relation to it, um, most notably um, through the Governance and Strategic Planning Committee and um, also members of the Anti-Poverty Task and Finish Group will also be familiar with this particular item because we've had several discussions in relation to it. Um, members, in terms of background, you can see that Council um, supported a motion in terms of the universal basic income to undertake a feasibility study um, in Northern Ireland to determine whether it will be feasible to have this um, run across in terms of all communities um, and in order to test this and um, they wanted to identify a number of pilot areas or pilot locations as they referred to um, and members you'll also be familiar in terms of some of that background that this um, universal basic income feasibility study is quite different from any of the others that have been completed um, globally in that that it's really designed to see if it can have an impact on peace building and for that reason, um, the UBI lab network had identified very particular criteria in terms of identifying the location. And in the background papers, um, members, you'll be familiar that this item was discussed on several occasions at the Anti-Poverty Task and Finish Group. And the most recent one was at their last meeting whenever the UBI lab network came along and give an update in terms of the feasibility study, in terms of the progress that had been achieved. Um, and also outlining um, the importance in terms of the criteria that they had identified and also in terms of particularly um, what they wanted to, to be taken forward within um, the Derry City and Strabane District Council area. Um, they also made us aware that um, one area had approached them um, and members are also aware that um, that area being the Tully Alley and Corrineer area had also contacted a number of elected members to say that if there was an opportunity um, that they would like to be considered 
in terms of any pilot location. However, before members could determine um, an area they needed to apply the criteria. And you can see that within the body of this report, um, we have identified the criteria and we've also shown in terms of how that criteria would be applied, um, particularly around being within the top 20% um, most deprived areas within our council area, um, that it had to be an interface area and that it had to have broad representation. Um, and we looked at those areas and at the anti-poverty task and finish group, um, they were satisfied that the Tully Alley and Curry near area um, would satisfy all of those criteria and wanted to make the recommendation members that this would be the area for the pilot location. Um, however, there were discussions um, previously in that um, could we have more than one area identified within the Derry City and Strand District Council area and if that was the case um, could we potentially look at a single identity area or could we look at um, a rural area. Um, the UBI lab network identified that at this stage this is purely for a feasibility study. Um, it is purely to undertake um, a trial location um, if the trial location was successful and if government deemed that this was an initiative that they would want to rule out, then every area within the council area um, would, deem, would be deemed as eligible going forward. Um, however, for the purposes of the study, only one area could be identified. However, the anti-poverty task and finish group said that whilst they recognised that that was the position of the UBI lab network, that, that we would write in um, putting forward our nomination in terms of the preferred location on the basis of their criteria, that we would also ask that in the event that further funding will become available or if the opportunity arose for a second um, trial location, that we would be able to identify a further area. And in that context, members, we would come back in terms of being able to identify potentially a single identity area or um, a rural area. So members, you have the information before you, um, the anti-poverty task and finish group, you know, um, we're happy with the progress that the UBI lab network has made at this stage. Um, everybody's very conscious that um, in order to take this forward in terms of a trial location, it is dependent on executive funding. Uh, and that's obviously dependent on an executive being up and running. So at this moment in time, there is no funding identified um, for the trial locations. Um, and at this moment in time, it just would be a desk exercise in terms of um, following on with further conversations and taking back um, further analysis um, whenever they would have that completed. And that will come back to the anti-poverty task and finish group. So Chair, very happy to take any questions in relation to the paper um, and any points of clarifications members might have in relation to it. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Councillor Ferguson. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Anna, for the, the report. And uh, I was part of the, the working group and had when UBI Lab had come in, and uh, I welcome this. You know, um, universal basic income is something that I think many of us within that working group can see as a positive. Um, I know everybody would love to have, and, and you have it in your report, everybody would love to have nominated probably 10 places in their own areas or um, the entire city and district to be a part of this pilot, if it does, and hopefully it will come uh, to fruition with the funding through executive. But I, I think it was a sensible choice um, to go for Tully Alley and Kernian because of the, the demographic and, and the fact that it was um, split and became, it, it does fit into their criteria, but also because it's an urban area that's on the cusp of being rural, so it does have those um, benefits to see in the possibility of the outcomes of the, the UBI trial. Um, I, I don't think your paper, your report needs a proposal, but I'm happy to pro propose that it is going ahead with the recommendations to Tully and Kareen and hopefully we will see an executive up soon and we will see much needed funding and to this study because it, it can only be for the better. Thank you again, Anna. Thank you, Councillor Ferguson. Councillor Fire, next speaker. Yeah, thanks, Chair, uh, and thanks, Una, for the report. I'm, I'm happy to second this proposal on behalf of the SDLP because you know we support the concept of universal basic income and we support the introduction of uh, a universal basic income. And we have to remember that this council has the highest levels of deprivation highest levels of unemployment, lowest levels of economic activity and some of the lowest wage levels um, across these islands. So it's not rocket science. You know, people in this city and district 
would benefit from more money in their pockets and a higher standard of living that, that could be provided by the universal basic income. So just in that, I think it's important that we uh, were involved in this feasibility study that you know, we contribute uh, financially to this feasibility study. And we support the recommendation that it's Tully Alley and Curry Nairn that, that's used it as the, the trail location. But just a word of warning to the people of Curry Nairn and, and Tully Alley, you, you're not going to see any extra money at the moment. It's just a feasibility study. And for the, the findings of that feasibility study to be actually implemented, we need a functional executive instalment. Um, so happy to support on behalf of the SLP. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fair. Alderman Guy. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the report. Um, the Martina from Uvi Lab actually was down in Tolly Alley Community Centre today. Uh, she held a bit of a focus group with a small group of residents from Tolly Alley. Um, basically, I had uh, she contacted me to set up the meeting. I had basically uh, give them a few slides and stuff of what universal basic income was all about. Um, so to give them a wee bit of knowledge going into the meeting today, uh, session lasted for about an hour and forty minutes. Uh, I have to say now it was it was very progressive, and all uh, the uh, residents who attended. Went away happy from it, and uh, they're, they're happy to partake in any other uh, focus groups that uh, they might need to before, if if we do come up with the money and uh, see it uh, put quite rightly under the Tully Alley and Curry near areas. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Alderman Gay. Um, next speaker is Councillor Harkin. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, Una, for the report. And look, uh, people for profit support looking at a universal basic income um, as a means of, uh, you know, uh, addressing deprivation and, and inequality. But we only support it on the basis that, it, uh, it, along with that, there is a defence and effort to strengthen our public services, uh, and increase taxes on the on big corporations and increase taxes on the super wealthy because a universal basic income uh, approach by itself will not actually address the big, big uh, inequality challenges that we have. Um, uh, and we're willing to uh, look at support uh, efforts that go in the direction of trying to do something uh, about this and that will help people. Um, it's very frustrating that, unfortunately, this is going nowhere right now, uh, that it is only a feasibility study in the middle of a cost of living crisis, an unprecedented cost of living crisis. Um, and because there's lots of good ideas on the shelves of Stormont, and unfortunately, the vast majority of them uh, are going absolutely nowhere right now in terms of it being implemented or uh, allowing organisations to try and uh, get them impl implemented. Um, so, as others have said, I don't want to be in the possession of raising the hopes uh, of people in Tully Alley and and um, Perineer and right now that they're that they're going to get extra help. And this is that extra help that people right across our district uh, need. Um, so that that is the only well that is a, a downside to this. Um, I, I, I um, we're happy to kind of uh, continue on with the effort of of looking at it. Uh, but in the meantime, if anybody wants to do anything about raising inequality, clearly the way to do that right now is by backing the strikes that are taking place. Uh, obviously, 20, uh, February twenty first is becoming. Uh, a bit of will become more of a general strike here across the north, as we see uh, housing executive workers in strike, university lecturers in strike, our health and social care workers will be in strike. All our teachers unions are going on strike, uh, and this is really part of the effort to address the cost of living crisis, uh, because of what what's behind the whole strikes is an attempt to uh, uh, push government to begin to look at how to redistribute wealth away from. Uh, corporate profiteers and away from uh, a super elite that is doing fantastically right now. Uh, and so I would appeal to people in Curry Nairn, Sam Nairn, uh, who are likely to maybe read about this discussion, um, that the way forward right now is in this feasibility study. It's to join those protests and to join that movement and to back the strike movement if we want to see wealth redistributed to help people in, in, in those community areas and right across our island. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Harkin. 
the next indicator speaker is Councillor Jackson. Grammy, I'll get the chair. And on behalf of Sean Fain, we, we support the recommendations that are contained within the report. And I suppose we share the frustrations that's, that, that have already been expressed within the chamber around um, the, the fact that, that a lot of this work can't be progressed because of the, the political stalemate, stalemate that exists in Stormont. And that, that's, that's well rehearsed, but, but there's nowhere where it's more profound in terms of um, the, in, in terms of the work that, 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 that was carried out in, in relation to this um, and supporting, supporting people that, that need it most. Um, there's there, there's certainly there, there's there's certainly um, a need for for government intervention and uh, we we would look forward to the work of the feasibility study seeing it hope seeing it seeing how it rolls out and in terms of the selection of of Korean Yearn and Tully Alley as 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 a trial um, we our pilot scheme we have we 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 fully accept. The rationale for the selection process, but again, um, they they reiterate the points that have already made that this 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 shouldn't be getting people's hopes up. This this is a, a feasibility study. Um, they they identify what we already know that there are huge inequalities um, within our system and or within society, and it needs to address. This is this is a way, a mechanism that that could be used to try and address some of the the inequalities. Um, but they, they they take real action. We do need an executive, and that's that that's a reality. So whilst whilst we we support the recommendations um, that's contained within this report and welcome the the broad support for it, um, we would reiterate the point: the the those that are holding back um, an executive from being informed, they give back the work, they they support people, and they actually take real tangible. Um, decisions that are going to provide meaningful support to those that need it most. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. The final speaker is Alderman Devaney. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me in. Uh, and on behalf of the DEP, we have no problem uh, in supporting the recommendation here um, to carry out the feasible, feasibility study uh, in the Tolly Alley, Corrineer area. And as previous speakers have said, yes, we all know the, the issues in and around that area. And Look, inequalities, and this will identify them. And we're happy to support the recommendation. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Alderman Devaney. With no further indicated speakers, I heard unanimous support for the, the paper. It's proposed by Councillor Ferguson. I actually don't have a second there, remember? Yep, oh, you did. Okay. Councillor Farr seconded. Um, yep, unanimous support. No one going against. We'll take those recommendations as passed. Members? I'm going to move on to item nine, which is update on Privacy Tenancy Act, and Seamus is going to take this item. Thanks, Chair. And the purpose of the report is to update members on new regulations that give councils enforcement powers from the 1st of April this year and to seek approval of the fixed penalty amount proposed. By way of background, members will be aware that DFC have been reforming the private rent sector. Uh, which includes the introduction of Private Tenancy Act, and this act aims to make the private rented sector a safer and more protected option. Members of the report outlines the additional requirements for the private rent sector and the penalty fine that councils can set. This includes provision of tenancy information outlining both landlord and tenant responsibilities relating to rent, deposits and repairs. Landlords are also now required to provide receipts for cash payments and cannot retain a deposit which is over one month's rent. And landlords are required to protect the tenancy deposits and provide details of the deposit scheme within specified timescales. Although DFC are not providing councils with financial support for this area of work, councils will retain fixed penalty receipts and it's recommend the committee note the new powers and agree the proposed level, fixed penalty level at £500. Thank you, Shivas. Um, first speaker, Councillor Fire. Uh, thanks, Chair, uh, and thanks, Seamus, for the report. I'm happy to propose this on behalf of the SDLP. 
I think it's um, it's a welcome change that's going to support people and protect people that are renting in the private sector. And I'm not going to go through every single aspect of the legislation, but you know the, the three key bits uh, for myself is that landlords are legally required to produce receipts for cash payments. Um, they can't ask for a deposit that's more than a month's rent, and they have to abide by the minimum notice they quit. Um, so it's useful that, that all of these things are, are now enshrined in leg legislation and that a landlord is actually guilty of an offence if they, if they don't adhere to that. Um, furthermore, I think it's useful that we as council have enforcement powers and we can issue £500 fines if landlords are, are found guilty of some form of malpractice. Um, but I wrote in the report that there's no financial support coming from DFC um, and that we envisage that the administrative burden of this could be far in excess of you know the, the fixed penalty notices that are received. Um, obviously, we need to do what we can to protect people. We need to do what we can to ensure that people in private rented accommodation are being treated fairly. But have we done any sort of modelling uh, to understand what the likely financial impact is on us here in the council? Happy to propose. Through you, Chair, I wouldn't go as far as saying there was financial modelling carried out, but based on other uh, fixed penalty receipts received for other offences in relation to housing, uh, we don't anticipate a huge number of fixed penalties being issued. In terms of landlords and tenancy awareness of the, the legislation and the requirements within it, uh, I would say landlords at this stage are more aware of their responsibilities and do take them more seriously. So you know, we, we would be responsible for dealing with harassment and illegal eviction. And we get very few complaints currently in relation to that as well. So we're not anticipating a huge number of uh, fixed penalties, stroke enforcement action. I have enough, Councillor Farrell, yeah. Okay. Next speaker, Councillor McGinley. For me, good chair, and um, we are delighted to see these powers coming through. And I know there's a lot of work that's been done through the Department for Communities on the Private Tenancies Bill and the Private Tenancies Act. Um, my party colleague here, Fergus Emily, would be our party spokesperson on housing and sat on the Department for Communities when this was progressing through. Um, so we understand fully the amount of work that's gone on to it. Um, we're, we welcome the new powers that are coming in um, for council because it'll give tenants that greater reassurance that they'll not be exploited by their landlord because if they are, there's enforcement powers that are now available to council that'll be easier to access for tenants. Um, and I think that that's important that um, within the private rental sector that um, at the minute can be a bit difficult to, to figure out your rights and, and what it is that you, you can do and what you can't do um, as, as a tenant, that it's it's making that more clear cut um, for tenants and it's given them that level of protection. So um, I'm happy to second the recommendations within the report uh, on behalf of Sinn Féin. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor McGinley. Um, Councillor Boyle, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, and this is very welcome and um, I'm sure the general public will welcome this also. And I suppose just in terms of getting that information out there in terms of the the, the new le uh, changes coming in, the new legislation coming in in April, um, just will we'll, we'll council be, we'll be doing our own PR, I'm sure, on it as well, um, uh, Shimas, um, because I think it's important that the public know of these changes and what their rights are. Um, it's probably uh, one of the one of the many single biggest issues that we get as as elected representatives, um, in terms of um, constituents coming to us about issues to do with their landlords and 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 their rights. And I think you know I suppose it's fair to say it's like everything else. There's always a few bad apples. It gives the rest of them a bad e name. There there are more good landlords out there than they are bad ones. And and. And many landlords want to do the right thing by their by their um, tenant, but I, I think um, as a, as an elected rep, I hear a, a lot from people that they can't afford the deposit 
because it is extortionate. So I think in terms of the changes to tenancy deposits now, um, I think a lot more people will be more willing to go into the private sector now because of that. Um, because let's face it, we don't have um, social housing uh, as we would like, um, particularly in my area uh, of Straban. So it's a very welcomed um, piece um, of work that has been ongoing for quite some time. And, um, uh, you know, the specific provisions of the legislation will apply from April. So I think it's important that there's a duty and a, an onus on us as well as a council to get that information out there, um, you know, to people, uh, to the public. Thank you. Uh, through you, Chair, and yes, uh, Councillor Boyle, all landlords are required to be registered, so we will arrange for that information to be provided to them and the website updated. And I'm sure DFC website will contain information as well. Thank you, Seamus. Next speaker is Alderman Devaney. Thank you, Chair, for uh, um, allowing me in. And on behalf of the DUP, look, um, we have no problem uh, in supporting um, the recommendation coming forward here today. I think this piece of work um, gives um, support uh, and protects um, tenants in that private rental market. And you know, the rental rental at the moment has gone through the roof. And you know, getting the deposit even to get into private rental has been a problem. But the, the, this uh, is good news here. And you know, I have to say, um, there are many, many good landlords out there uh, um, doing a really, really good job. But there are just some not doing as good a job. And I think, like previous speakers, I think it's important that Seamus has said it there that um, we get this information out um, to those prospective people who may be interested in moving into the private rental because of the unavailability of social housing. But on behalf of the DEP, happy to support the recommendation, Chair. Thank you, Alderman Devaney. Councillor Doyle. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Seamus, for the report. Um, the legislation uh, is welcome. Um, we would have liked to see some form of a, a statutory time limit for repairs carried out to be with them, but um, but as it is, it's a step forward. Um, just wanted to ask, just in terms of the tenancy information notice, I, I've actually had a case uh, just at the end of last week where the property that uh, was privately rented from a, an estate agent, um, there were a lot of um, repair issues to be carried out um, on the property, but um, would you believe it? The landlord had an, or sorry, the estate agent had a number for the landlord, um, but the person who actually owned the house was overseas um, and was really not contactable. Um, can you give us an idea, Seamus, if you can, how that would work? Because it wouldn't be, I, I don't think it would be overtly helpful if people get information from a uh, and a state agent to say that they're the, the contact detail? Does it have to be the, the person who actually owns the property? Um, and is there any kind of, um, I haven't read legislation in a while, um, but is there any onus on the actual landlord to be accessible? Um, or is that just, you know, can it be through a, um, a letting agency, for example? Thank you. Through, through you, Chair, the, the tenancy information relates to rent, deposits, length of tenancy, and also who's actually responsible for carrying out repairs, whether that be the tenant or the landlord. In terms of contact details or you know, if a landlord is based abroad, I'm not 100% sure in terms of the requirement there, but I will follow up and provide an update to you. Happy that, Councillor Doyle. Get an update. Thanks so much. No problem. Next speaker, Alderman Kerrigan. Thank you for allowing me in, Chair, and, and Alderman Rennie has spoke on behalf of the group. Uh, just a brief question there, and uh, apologies, Chair, I'm just going to air my frustration here again at, at ModGov, because I uh, decided to just wipe out everything I had, all my notes and everything else, and now I have I have no, uh, I have a very free week because I'm very free month, maybe, because everything's gone off ModGov there, which just happened since the meetings commenced. So, um, which is always powerfully useful when you're trying to raise a comment. But uh, nonetheless, I, I was just, I, I say, I don't have the information now in front of me, Seamus, and I apologise. Uh, I, I was just querying there, 
um, there there are uh, well this is welcome and again there are a few bad apples out there uh, again and nearly any of Alderman Kerrigan is still there. Okay, members, Jim is going to follow up with Alderman um, Kerrigan, I'd say, the meeting. Uh, Councillor Hargan, you want to go ahead? Thank you, Chair. And thanks, Seamus, for the report. And like others have said, um, the, the the new private tenancies bill is welcome. Uh, there are uh, provisions in there that will strengthen tenants' rights. Um, uh, and these have been long campaigned for by, uh, you know, many housing groups. Um, and I think that the council has a role to play in making sure they are enforced, especially around deposits, but on the other aspects as well. Uh, and it is the case that many people uh, don't feel like their landlord, or can feel that their landlord isn't accessible, and that's part of the part of the challenge. So I think that our promotion of uh, the 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 new rules uh, that landlords have to abide by is going to be very very important. Um, so we welcome that uh, from our point of view, from people before profits point of view, in terms of the overall bill and act. Uh, we don't think it went far enough, uh, especially around uh, rent controls. Uh, or reductions. There's nothing concrete in there. And I think now, uh, in a cost of living crisis, we can see why there, ne there needs to be action on uh, rent controls. Uh, people are paying far too much as it is for their rent, uh, and rental prices are only going up. But there is nothing, there is no mechanisms that are, that are within this to, to um, uh, put in price controls or rent controls. So that's very disappointing. There does appear to be a mechanism uh, within the bill for a review of how this works. So we'll be uh, looking f uh, when it is actually implemented and we see it rolled out. Uh, that'll be an opportunity for people to give uh, feedback. Uh, but uh, you know there there are, there are important new provisions in here. So we we uh, we want we welcome their introduction um, and the council's role in making sure they're enforced. Thank you. Councillor Hergen. Councillor Doyle, I'm going to let you back in for your very quick question. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, she was, just in terms of the process, um, you know, I'm, I'm conscious that this will all probably go through your team. If we do, for example, find that, um, that our landlord is in breach of this and we report it to your team, how, do you have an idea in terms of time frame or, or are there mediations in place where you know, your team will contact the landlord and say, we've been made aware of this, fix it? Or, um, you know, when do we get to the stage where this becomes court action? Thank you. Through you, Chair, I suppose if there's an alleged uh, offence, the council officers will make direct contact with both the landlord and the tenant, both to obtain evidence and try and resolve the issue. For, for some of the offences, no, it, it may be just the, the landlord as an oversight in the landlord and it needs uh, some awareness and education and council officers be happy enough to provide that, provided it's the issues rectified within a short space of time. Uh, there's one offence probably that's more critical and that's in terms of the protection of the tenancy deposit and in terms of the time frames and also uh, the fixed penalty for that offence is three times the value of that deposit. So, as I say, we have a response time of three days, and it really depends on the seriousness of the alleged offence in terms of time scale to either get it resolved or prepare a, a case for potential prosecution. Can I answer your question, Councillor Doyle? Thank you, Chair. No problem. Members, I hear unanimous support as well. And um, for item nine, I'm going to take it as passed here. No one going against. Well, Councillor Donnelly, I'm actually going to bring you bring in. Go ahead, Councillor Donnelly. I'm not about sure. Uh, no, it's just just uh, listening to some of the, the conversation there. And you know, recently there's been a lot of talk about mold and damp, and 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 I know Council have uh, at a recent meeting uh, between a lot of the sort of social landlords uh, in the city and district. You know it was discussed, but you see when 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 having had these these sort of 
powers or responsibilities. Now, see in regards to the mold and damp, is is there a time frame? You know, if say if if if, if either a, a, an elected rep or, or or a tenant contacts regarding mold and damp, and council go out and and you know environmental health will go out and have a have a look at it and do whatever tests. Do they have a? Is there a policy uh, to follow up? They ensure that the work is being uh, done, or you know that <clears throat> excuse me, that the problem is is being rectified in in, in a responsible manner. Manner, sorry. Through you, Chair. Yeah, Councillor Donnelly. Again, the response time is three three working days, and and that applies to all service areas within environmental health. And so officers would carry out a visit ideally within that time frame and gather the evidence. The difficulty in terms of mould and condensation, you know, it may be attributed to rising damp, penetrating damp. And if that is the case, then action can be taken uh, and enforcement notices issued to the landlord. Uh, the difficulty with condensation is that uh, it may be as a result, as you know, from the activities of the tenant and so it's more difficult to resolve and again with the the cost of living there's a lot of advice provided to tenants that may not uh, help resolve this issue a reduce settings on thermostats heat in one room and so we will provide advice to tenants in relation to condensation and how they can alleviate that problem themselves but if it is a case that the landlord's responsible to deal with rising or penetrating damp, council will take take action. Thank you. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. Through yourself, Chair, just when we... Yeah, go ahead. Is that okay? Now, you see, you're saying that, that uh, if there is rising damp or penetrating damp, that uh, enforcement issue uh, notices can be, be, be issued. Do council follow up to ensure that the, the the work is carried out by the landlord, or is the who's is the onus of responsibility on the person who reported it, or do they just notify the landlord? Look, here's what the problems are. Is, is there a follow up? Do that. Yeah, big one, Yeah, yeah. Again, through chair, if if an enforcement notice is issued, the council officer will follow up within the the required time frame, depending on what's stipulated on the enforcement notice. So it may be 30 days, it could be three months to carry out the works, depending on the, the the works required. And again, they will liaise on an ongoing basis with the tenant and to determine whether works have been carried out or have been initiated. And the case would not be closed until the works have been complete. And if they haven't been complete, enforcement action would be considered. You happy there, Councillor Romney, with that response? Yeah, thanks. And I do agree with you, Councillor. I just want to comment as well. You know, people contact me, they're afraid they report damp on their house when they're in a private uh when they're a private tenant. They're afraid of landlord reactions at times. And and that's something that really strikes me. People are living in damp, but they're scared to report it as well because the landlord will know who reports it. And that's I think that's why we do need more social homes um, in the city and district. But that's my passing comment, Jimis. Um, members are full support for um, item nine. There's no one going against. Um going to take it as passed as proposed. Council of Fire, second Council of Guinea, going to take it as passed. Members, going to move on to item 10, which is Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, Brand Funding Offer, Capacity and Capability Building Program in Northern Ireland, non-food products, 2022-2023. And Seamus, you're taking this item as well? So proposed. Proposed, Councillor Farr, seconder. Seconder, Councillor Boyle. It's proposed by Brian and seconded by the Right, okay. Members, anyone want to comment, comment, support? No, nope. we'll take that as item 10 is unanimous. Members, uh, items 11 to 14 um, are open for information. If anyone wants to raise any issues, items 11 to 14. No. Nope. Anyone online? No. Nope. Members, can I get a proposer and seconder to go into confidential business? Propose Councillor Boyle, second Councillor Fire. We'll just take a few moments for confirmation that we're in confidential. 